mode. Hi, good afternoon and welcome everybody. This is the monthly Outmatch webinar series. I'm your host, Dan Houts. Outmatch delivers the data that's missing from your hiring process. With clear, measurable insight into candidates and new hires, you will make better hiring decisions and your organization will finally be able to measure the impact of hiring on your company. First, a couple housekeeping items. We, if you have questions during the webinar, you can type them into the GoToWebinar queue or tweet them to at OutmatchHCM with the hashtag OutmatchInsights. We'll address all the questions at the end of the, present of the presentation, so please be patient. I'm very excited to introduce today's presenter, Jason Ferrara, is the Chief Marketing Officer here at Outmatch. Jason not only has a background in human capital management, but also in building technology solutions to solve human capital challenges. Jason? Thanks, Dan, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for participating today. Uh, so today we're going to discuss the five keys to outstanding candidate experience. Uh, you know, candidate experience has many different definitions, and people have lots of opinions about what a good or a poor candidate experience might be. Um, today we're going to talk about what we think are the big items related to candidate experience, not um, debate the exact definition, but talk about those big items, things that can really impact candidate experience and, and things that are, are the most important for candidate experience. And, you know, as we go through this presentation, you know, there are some things that that you might be doing today that I will talk about, and that's fantastic. And there are some things that might be new to you, and that's also fantastic. So, you know, I think this is an opportunity to hear some things uh, that you already know and, and, and hopefully learn some things that, uh, that are new. Um, but really the most important goal is to get you thinking about your candidate experience at your, at your own organization. What is it? Do you sit in meetings and talk about candidate experience? Is it, a, is it a leadership team issue? Is it just a human resources team issue? Do hiring managers care about it? Um, you know, these are all the, the questions that, that we should be asking and, and trying to answer every day. So we'll go through those today. But first, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is just get us on the same page about what is candidate experience. You know, I said just a moment ago that there are lots of definitions. Uh, this definition from, from Smart Recruiters, one of our partners, is the one I like the best. Um, it isn't super exciting, but it does capture exactly what we want to capture, which is uh, the candidate experience starts with the first communication between a company and a candidate. And it involves the overall treatment from beginning to end of that candidate. And that's what I think so so important from beginning to end, right? This is the very first interaction, which may not be a personal interaction. It may be an interaction, uh, you know, when, when I was growing up and looking for a job, it was the newspaper, but today, obviously, it's going to be online. It's going to be LinkedIn. Those are the first interactions. They're not even personal interactions. And then to the end, and I think one of the things that's important about defining the end is the end doesn't mean I got a signed offer letter back from a candidate. The end for us really means that new hire period up to 90 days or 100 days because there's so much information that you can gather from new hires about the candidate experience that then you can feed back into your hiring process and really have a positive impact on your candidate experience. So that beginning to end is just such, such an important thing. and, and you know, we want to make sure when we talk about candidate experience, we just don't think about the interview process, or we just don't think about how the how the job ad is written. We want to think about think about all of that. You know, my my day to day one of my day to day roles at Outmatch is is, is marketing. So, um, I, going through this presentation, it is striking to me how much marketing there is in candidate experience. You know, candidate experience is a very one to one type. Uh, process. I, I want to create communications for an individual candidate, and I want to have conversations with an individual candidate. Very similar to the way that 
you know, when, when I have my marketing hat on, I think about uh, driving a lead or talking to a prospect or a customer. It's very one-on-one -on -one communication. So we'll come back to that theme here, too, because this is not just a, oh, this is the realm of HR, the realm of, of um, the hiring manager. It really is the realm of the entire company, the brand, the way you go to market. Those are all such important pieces of, of candidate experience. The problem here, though, is that the state of candidate experience is not good. It is, it is uh, surprisingly poor. Um, we know that through some data that we can that, that that we found in our research, but you can go out and, and search that. And if you really do some soul searching about your own business, I bet there are areas where you can come up with improvements to your candidate experience. But this this first stat about just employers are not sharing important information like day in the life. You know, almost 60% of your candidates are not understanding what a day in the life of the person on the job is going to be. I don't think that's anything magical. Certainly when we look to get a new job, we look at, well, what's the day-to-day -day responsibility of this role? You know, if, if we ask ourselves those questions, isn't everybody asking those questions? And why are we not answering those questions? That, you know, that's a big that's a big problem. Or understanding the career path. Half the people, half the candidates don't understand the career path. And that's not a good place to be. Um, the, the, next, the next stat is 32% uh, of candidates did not get information about how to prepare for the interview. Now that could be, who am I meeting with? What do those people care about? What are their motivations in the business or their titles? Should I come? Should I have done research? I mean, those things you think, yeah, everybody who's interviewing should should know how to do certain things uh, when they go into an interview. But not everybody knows, and you know, we can really help that because we can help people prepare to be successful. And isn't that like what we're trying to do as human beings anyway? Is is help people be successful, right? Help people prepare. And then you know, I just think the most damning uh, stat on this whole page is less than half of new hires received a phone call from their hiring manager during the onboarding process. And it just, you know, that, that, that stat just makes me sick to my stomach. Like we're hiring people and then the person who's their, their supervisor, the hiring manager, is not connecting with them, is not calling and saying, we're so happy you're aboard, or is that calling even to say something like, hey, fill out your paperwork, like no contact. That is just a, it's a very weird thing. And so, you know, these stats, of course, are one extreme, right? They make, they make these candidate experience look dire. They make, they make it look like we're not trying, but we are trying. I mean, that's, you know, that's why we're all here together today. We're, we're trying. We're trying to do our best. We're trying to do this really well. I think the question is, why does it matter? Why are we trying so hard? And, and the reason is this, is this stat right here. So, 47% of applicants have no previous relationship with your company or your brand. This is the first time being a candidate for a job at your organization that almost half the people have an interaction with your brand. Now, you may be a huge brand that everybody sees every day driving down the street. You may be a B2B brand that, that is so fundamental to the running of a business um, that you're embedded in there so people don't recognize your, you as your brand. Um, you're almost, you know, your employees are almost white labeled into, into the location. Um, this is the first exposure to the brand. So whether you're B2B or B2C company, the reality is you have customers and you have people who can be referrals and you want that experience with your brand to be, to be outstanding. And that's why we're talking about, about candidate experience and and what it means to the brand, right? We don't want to do a disservice to our brand. Well, aside from branding, there are another a, 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 another a set of reasons, and, and those set of reasons come from a great paper that Career Crossroads has done about why candidate experience is, is critical. And we'll just go through these, these bullets a little bit. I, I won't read them because you can read them yourself, but the first one, I don't want to upset any recruiters that are on the phone, but the reality is for a candidate, the hiring manager is more important than, than you as a recruiter. 
Uh, they're the ones who drive a lot of that candidate experience. That doesn't mean, however, that as a recruiter you're not important because the other thing that you see on here is the influence, the positive influence that a recruiter can have is early in that process, right, right at the start of that process. And, and what does that recruiter need to do? Like, what is that influence? That influence is what, what's here is called warmth and knowledge about the job. I like to call that being a professional, right? As, as humans, we should be warm and we should care about these, these candidates and we should want them to succeed. And so that natural just kind of humanity and warmth should come through from a recruiter. And then also knowledge about the job. This is a very tactical thing, but incredibly serious. I know everyone on the phone has had the experience of talking to a recruiter who was just taking notes for someone else, who didn't understand the breadth, the depth of the job that they were talking to you about. And I know each of you had the same experience that I did, which is this conversation is a waste of time because this person doesn't know anything about the job. That's a bad sign. Those are, those, that's, when, that's when people write off your company, when that happens. So recruiters who are warm and, and have knowledge about the job. The other bullet there is about reactions to selection questions, tests, screens. So when you're using an assessment in your selection process, it's really important that the assessment links to the job that the person's applying for. And we'll talk about that in a minute here, but, but that linkage is incredibly important. Right, the relevancy. I think about this just like again, just like I think about marketing. Relevancy is so important when it comes to assessment because you can tell if an assessment's relevant to the job. Am I being asked the questions that I think will be the 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 skills or the competencies needed for this job? That's incredibly important. Obviously, delays in the recruitment process negatively impact candidate reactions. I don't I don't think that is uh, surprising to to anyone on the phone. Um, and then next steps. You know, next steps are so important, and unless we, as as human capital professionals, are thinking through the next steps beforehand, you know, that's a question everyone, every candidate should be asking this question: What are the next steps? And I hear all the time, uh, you know, you you take a beat to think about it, and that beat to think about it may not feel long to you, but it feels really long to the candidate who says to themselves, hmm, they don't know what the next steps are. That's odd. Shouldn't they know what the next steps are? So again, part of our process is to sit down and say, great, we're all gung-ho because we need a new business analyst. Uh, we're all gung-ho because we're down, we're down a few salespeople on the floor. We're all gung-ho because we need 10 more servers for this big event which is coming up. But what are the next steps when that person applies? All those little details really, really matter. And so, you know, those are the reasons why it matters that we, that we take care of candidate experience. But almost most importantly, we want to find ways to quantify candidate experience. Right? There are many things that you hear, like you want to walk in the candidate's shoes, and you want to communicate clearly, and all those things are certainly true. But what we want to do is we want to be able to quantify candidate experience. We want to be able to quantify the candidate as it relates to the experience needed for the job. And that is really what we're going to talk about today as we go through the agenda. The five keys to outstanding candidate experience. One is defining success in the role. Two is measuring candidate job fit. Three is beating interview exhaustion. Four is getting the full story on a candidate. And five is measuring the new hire impact. Right? And I alluded to that earlier, which is candidate experience for us doesn't stop with a signed offer letter or someone who says, yes, I'll take the job. Right? It really is about things that happen as a new hire as well. So we'll talk about the first, the first piece here. Defining success in the role. So what we want to understand is what makes a person succeed in this position. This is one of those things that, that seems like we should all have figured out all the time, yet it's not. Right? We're filling a position that is either evergreen and we feel like we know what it is, or we're 
pulling a position that feels so urgent we don't feel like we have time to sit down and answer that question, what makes a person succeed? But this is how good hiring decisions start. They start with good hiring criteria. They start with job-relevant, competency-based criteria. So you can compare people. You can compare apples to apples, right? Um, you need, in order to do this, you need to ask that question, what makes a person succeed? So in order to answer that question, what makes a person succeed, it's incredibly important to build competency-based criteria. And so competency-based criteria will help you outline what's needed for the role and will help you look at, in the most tactical level, look at resumes and understand whether that person exhibits those competencies. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about how to, how to see that. But a couple of reasons why competencies matter and why you need to focus on competencies. One of those is that competency-based selection favors diversity, right? We'll talk about interview bias in a few slides, but the reality is you want people with skills, you want people with competencies, you want people with the right culture, fit, and personality for your organization. Those people come in all shapes and sizes and colors and experience and backgrounds and all that. And you can get to that, you can get that diverse community within your organization when you use competencies. Second is when you base your interviews on competencies, when you ask questions based on competencies, those questions are evergreen. You can ask them again and again. Every interview, you can use the question. You don't have to recreate an interview. Oh, this person's coming in. You know what? I forgot and I, that I have an interview. Or I have six interviews in one day. How am I going to prepare for all those interviews? Well, you're asking competency-based questions, so you're going to ask something consistent. You're going to ask that of each person because you're trying to understand their, their competencies. And then the third thing is competencies are really good at identifying transferable skills. This is something that people talk about a lot, certainly in the context of military veterans entering uh, the private sector, is usually where you hear about transferable skills. You know, I, I, I commanded the tank battalion so I can uh, manage a call center. Um, you know, th those sorts of transferable skills are, are real, but also within an organization, if you think about project management skills, or transferable skills like I've been waiting tables for 10 years and now I'm going to uh, apply to run a customer service desk. You know, those competencies and skills about the ability to do multiple things at once and handle pressure and solve customer problems, those are all transferable skills that you can uncover when you use competencies to define job success. And so here are some examples of competencies. You know, this, these examples are, are from a specific type of, of job. The jobs, that, the roles that you have to fill may require different competencies, right? But in-depth problem solving and analysis, championing change, business acumen, coaching and developing others, relationship management, these are the kinds of things that you'll want to uncover, and that's what we mean by quantifying defining success for the job, right? You can quantify what success means when you look at these competencies. I need someone who drives for results. Well, what does drive for results mean? What are the behaviors there? And what are my expectations with the role? Using competencies will really help build consistency in the candidate experience, right? Because candidates for a specific role will have the same type of experience. They won't, they won't have this up and down, and no one in your organization will have up and down related to candidates. So that's, there's consistency there, and there's also clarity. There's clarity for the candidate. This is what we expect is success, means success in this role, and it will build clarity internally, too, among hiring managers and recruiters. This is the expectation for this job. We are on the same page here. Let's move forward to understand and, and bring people in and hire them. So that's, that's key number one, defining success in a job. So key number two is measuring candidate job fit. So now that I know what success means, how do I make sure that I hire a candidate that fits that definition of success? 
So you're going to apply the competencies, apply that definition to job success. So we're going to talk about those. What do you measure? How do you do that? Because it seems very easy to say, well, yes, of course, you just apply that to this and then you move on. But, but how, do, how do we do that? What are the things that we're going to, to measure? I think that's a real, a real question. So what we're going to measure is candidate job fit. But we're going to try to do it in the most holistic way possible. Right? So people are not as unpredictable as we once thought, which means that hiring shouldn't be a guessing game. Right? We're not, we're not going to do that. Um, what we want to do is a multi-step approach that will help build layers of understanding about a candidate. And so this candidate picture here, right, we want to know about her culture fit and we want to put her through a simulation which might tell us a little bit about how she's going to act in a real world scenario. We want to understand more about her personality and so in order to do this, in order to get this holistic view of a person, we're going to apply assessment to this. Assessment will help us understand the candidate job fit. And those assessments have competencies and that definition of success built into that assessment. So that's how we measure the definition of success. We use competencies. We use a personality assessment. We can use a cognitive assessment. We can use culture fit indicators. We can put people through situational judgment and simulations. These are all different types of assessment to understand a person's personality, understand their ability to process information, understand their ability to just have, have basic skills. Right, so if you think about that, that uh, list of competencies a few slides ago, drive for results. Well, drive for results probably has a skill level to an assessment. Drive for results has a personality level assessment, and drive for results really has a cognitive level assessment. When we do uh, assessment for servers, for example, or managers of a restaurant, one of the skills slash competencies <laughs> slash cognitives is can they read a profit and loss statement? It seems to be a very basic thing. Let me give you this little test. But not only can you read it, of course I can, I can, hopefully I can read and I understand the numbers, but can I make sense out of it? Can I, can I turn that information into a decision or an action? And that's how you take success competencies and turn them into measuring candidate job fit. So I'm not going to give you a demo. I just want to show you then how the competencies and how the traits, when a candidate takes an assessment, what you'll look at, right? The data that you'll look at. We're talking about measuring as much as possible. I do want to show you what that looks like once you've measured it. Here's a screen, albeit it's small, because what I really want you to look at is, is this part of the screen. You see on the left, there are a number of traits. These traits, agreeableness, dependability, achievement driving, conscientiousness, you, you can read those traits. And then on the right, you see where that candidate falls in relationship to that particular trait. The yellow is the range that we want people to be in, and the blue dot is that person. So if you look ambition and dominance, this person is outside of the normal range for this particular position. They're within range, but on the high side, of some of these and on the low side of others. Now, I, I'm not going to analyze this person related to these assessment results, but these are the types of results that you will get, not only for an individual, and this is very important when it comes to an individual, but it is almost more important when it comes to multiple individuals, right? Because we're talking about assessments giving us the ability to compare people and see who fits the best in the role. And that's what an assessment will do, right? We, a foundation of understanding of what makes people successful, deliver an assessment. The assessment results in data. We use that data to make that decision. We use the measurement to make that decision. So one individual, it's cool to see multiple individuals is where all the insight comes from once you've applied that measurement.
The other piece that I think is important just with this picture is once you hire someone, these assessment results are still very important. You don't put them on a shelf. Uh, you don't just you know put them in a report and give, them, give it to the new hire and say, great, and that person goes home and it sits on their countertop for a while and they move it to four different places in their house until they throw it away. The hiring manager can still be using this information. Right? And the way that I use this information it, in my life um, and, and the way that and, and, and a number of our, our clients already do too, which is where I learned it, is if I need to build teams, I oftentimes look at assessments because I want people with complementary skills on teams. And so that's a, just a broad stroke of what to do with assessment results once you have them. But realize that once you measure and get this insight on this individual or multiple people, this assessment information lives on and can be used again and again for multiple reasons. So with assessment, it's important to build an assessment that's automated as much as possible and that's integrated into your selection process. There's another area in my, in my notes where I circled something and said, this is just like marketing, automated integrated workflow, right? We want to try to set up a strategy and set up a set of rules that we can then use in a repeatable fashion. That's especially important if we have high volume positions that we're hiring for. If I'm hiring restaurant servers and I have a couple hundred locations, I've got to do this over and over and over and over and over. So I want that automated and integrated. But even if I'm not hiring for thousands of people over and over, I want it automated and integrated as well so that there's consistency in the results. And so that the candidate experience, let's get back to that, is the same. If I integrate my assessment into the workflow of applying for the job with the ATS, for example, it is a seamless experience that a candidate has. This company, I've applied here, I received an, an email back, I responded, I received another request, I responded, and it's all in the context of that one company, all in the context of that one brand. And so, as a candidate on the outside, what I see is a connected, integrated organization, the kind of place that, because they know what they're doing, I have a greater propensity to want to be a part of. And that automated, integrated process, then, can be powerfully predictive for you, can really help predict, especially in, in high-volume hiring situations, predictive of success on the job. And that's really where we're trying to get to, too. Since all this measurement and this insight, we want to predict, is this person likely to be successful? That can be used from initial screening all the way through the reference check and, as I said, even passed into the hire. So assessment helps you get a holistic picture, be more thorough in your selection process, and helps drive greater understanding. Okay, so the third piece here is how to beat interview exhaustion using structured interviews. Now, an interview is, you know, I mean, it's, we have so much mental energy taken up with the interview, um, we do want to spend some time on it because most everyone who you're hiring goes through some sort of interview. Now, I would argue that most everyone you're hiring should go through a definition of job success and go through an assessment also. In some cases, that's true. In some cases, it's not. Almost everybody goes through an interview. So let's talk about this. You know, interview exhaustion happens mainly with unstructured interviews. And what happens, and we'll talk about a little bit about what an unstructured interview is. The, the outcome, though, from an unstructured interview, you really have two outcomes. You as an interviewer, you don't learn anything about the person because you haven't asked critical questions, questions based on job success. And the other thing that happens is the candidate watches you struggle your way through a bunch of questions that are relatively meaningless for success on the job and says to themselves, what are they looking for? What are they trying to get here? I'm confused. I don't understand. So a structure is a way to ask the right questions to get responses that then you can rate. Again, how are we measuring? We want to measure an interview. 
not have it be some subjective conversation. So ask the right questions that we can then rate responses and we can generate some sort of benchmark for that interview. So again, structured interviews. This is, a, this is an important part about candidate experience. Bias is a big issue with interviewing in general. None of us like to admit that bias exists and we all think we're above it, but the reality is bias exists. And structured interviews help erase that bias. So there's the prejudging bias. Well, I see that this person was in a certain student organization, so I know what they're like already. That is prejudging. Or halo and horror, right? Oh, this person has a gap in their resume. They must not be a good candidate. Like, they're all bad. That gap means they're all bad. You know, projection. My uncle was in the Army. So was this person. So, therefore, I know how they will respond to a certain situation. And then generalizing. You know, this: all salespeople are the same. All line cooks are the same. Right? That's just not, not true. But those things happen, and those things happen primarily when you have an unstructured interview. So putting some structure behind the interview, asking questions that are related to success on the job, will help eradicate some of this bias. So secrets to structure, right? What are the, what are the secrets to structure? What are some, some takeaways here? You want to base your questions on the job analysis. And by job analysis, I mean the definition of success. You did all this work to define success. You did all this work to uncover competencies and, and put together an assessment that will help measure those competencies and traits. You want to put an interview together that does the same thing. Right? Those questions are, based in, are, are, are supposed to measure the same thing, the competency. I know what your assessment results are. I'm going to put you through an interview and ask you very similar questions. And then I can compare, as I rank them, the interview and the assessment and see how consistent that is. It helps me ask, ask effective uh, questions. Right? An effective question is, give me an example of a time in which you solved, you successfully solved a customer's problem. Rather than, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation here. Let's say it's 20 below zero and a customer comes in and their heat doesn't work and you spilled coffee on your shirt. You know, these hypotheticals don't make any sense. You want to ask about specific things that people did. You want to understand their behaviors. Each candidate gets the same question in a structured interview. Because remember, it's for the same position. Same position, different candidate, same questions. You score the results. You can compare them to the assessment. And now you're measuring. And you know what you get from all that measurement? You get insight into whether that person can be successful. Rating scales we talked about. You know, training interviewers is something important. And again, I, I would almost bet that every single one of you on the phone has been in some session somewhere at SHRM or HR Tech or ongoing continuing education that talks about interviewer training. And everyone groans when they hear that. And no one wants to go do it. And it is so incredibly important. <laughs> it's amazing. So you know, we don't have to have interview training be long or boring. It can actually be fun. But again, relevancy and context is so important. Like why are we going through interview training? Because we want to improve our candidate experience. When a candidate has an interview and they know you're taking notes and they know that you're listening and they see the job in the questions that you're asking, that's a meaningful interview. When a candidate gets a bunch of cockamamie questions that they don't see you, they don't see themselves in, they'll leave confused. That is not a great candidate experience. That's what we're talking about, getting the right information to candidates and, and, and asking them questions that will help you make the best choice, help you understand who the best fit is. So those are some of the, some of the secrets to structure. Once you begin doing structured interviews, you want to be vigilant. Right? You want to keep doing it that way. That doesn't mean that you can't improve on some questions. It doesn't mean that you can't train more people. It doesn't mean that you can't change something that you don't think is working. But you need to be vigilant to 
continue to drive that consistent interview experience. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on get a phone preview, although I think that's important. That person's not sitting in front of you, so their responses are pure without any context of who they are. Oh, they're the portfolio they brought in is all beat up, or that that's a pencil, not a pen. Right? Does any of that really matter if you could do the job? Probably not. So with a phone preview, you don't have any of that baggage about they're using a pencil over a pen. And then it's important to take your time. And I, I don't want this to come across like I'm going to drag out the interview process and not give people an answer, because that surely is not going to drive positive candidate experience. We already heard about that on like slide three, delays in the process. But we want to make sure we're not making a snap judgment. Snap judgments don't help us as managers of a business. Even if it's positive, you meet somebody and say, that's the person right there. I see their assessment results. The score They scored so highly in this interview. Those two things match up. I know they're going to be successful in the job. I'm going to hit them before they walk out of the door and offer them the job. Chances are good. That's a snap judgment. You may want to wait for 24 hours, sleep on it. You know, it, while sleep on it may be, uh, may be cliched, um, just putting some distance will really help gain some perspective. And plus, you're not going to look as desperate as you are when you are chasing someone out of your building to ask them if they would like the job. Sorry, just had a little bit of water there. The fourth part of outstanding candidate experience is getting the full story. So what we want to do is we want to collect information from a person's references. But we want to collect information that will be usable in the hiring process. And the reality is very few companies collect good usable information from a reference process from a reference check process. In fact, only about 25% of companies say they have a good process. So the rest of us, the 75% of us are either out there doing nothing or doing the same old thing. And I might argue that the same old thing is worse than doing nothing. The same old thing of Okay, give me a sheet of paper with four people on it, and I'll call them and leave messages until I'm blue in the face, and I'll be frustrated by that, and I'm not going to get any information, and I'm never really going to know. Like that's a bad, that's not only a bad candidate experience while they're waiting around for you to get back to them, but that's a bad experience for you as a as a hiring manager or an HR professional. So if your reference check process is a is a game of phone tag, we we got to change that. So here's what we want to do. We want to use reference checking to understand, to answer three questions. Right? One is, can this person do the job? Two is, will this person do the job? And three is, have they done this job before? That's what we want to know in a reference check. Well, essentially, that's what we want to ask people. But we're going to ask it in an automated, anonymous way. And so the candidate experience is something like, Gloria, we'd like to get references from you. I'm going to send you a link. You may put your references in. It will email those people. Those people will be asked questions. Those people will respond to me directly. So the candidate has control of who they choose still, just like the piece of paper. But the person who's responding can choose to respond anonymously. The person who's responding is asked meaningful questions that relate to job success, that relate to the assessment questions, and that relate to the structured interview questions. So now we have another data point to verify the assessment to verify the interview score about can this person do the job, will this person do the job, has this person done the job. And what we see 
our completion rates near 80%, right? The first thing I thought of was, well, nobody's going to fill that out if it's anonymous and it's another email and that's annoying and that is not true. People fill it out. Completion rates above 80%. And they fill it out quickly. They fill it out about 90% faster than a traditional reference check. So not only are you getting better information, you're getting it sooner. So from a candidate experience, they have a little more control over the reference check process. And you can respond to them faster, which is one of those core what makes for a good candidate experience is faster response. That happens when you do reference checks the right way. So the kinds of things you want to check, you know, you want to check the facts. This is very just the facts. I want, I want to know date of hire and title and position and were you telling me the truth, essentially. But the other things around what did you learn, right? What did you learn about this person, working with this person, what they were like to work with? And also, does this person fit, right? Again, the other data point, assessment interview, reference check, all these data points you can now compare. We're gathering measurement so that we can generate greater insight. That's what we're working on here. Okay, and then the fifth piece of candidate experience, and this is what I was talking about early on in the, in the, in the conversation, which is it doesn't stop when I say, yes, I want the job, or it doesn't stop when I sign the offer letter. Gathering information from new hires is incredibly important. And this is another spot collectively that we do a terrible job on. Terrible job. We may not collect information until your annual performance review or, or 18 months later. You're so new, we're not going to do a performance review at the end of this year. We'll wait till the end of the next year. I mean, that's such a long time. Think about a restaurant server. Many of those people might not even work for you in 12 months. And when they leave, you haven't learned a thing about them because you haven't asked about them. So what we want to do is we want to begin measuring the output of our hiring process by asking new hires very specific questions. It's really effective. And once you have that data, you'll be able to feed that data back into your hiring process. So you want to quantify as much as you can. You want to get that data. You know, you've got such access to so much more data now in our jobs. I mean, I was just, I was just at my kid's school and, and I was felt very old because all the textbooks are online. You know, <laughs> all their math homework is it's all online. And just the amount of data that is available that even my children are using in school Think about that, what we have as adults, what we have access to. We've set up these CRM systems. We've set up ATS. We've set up, I mean, on your, on your computer, you've got Excel can do more calculations than almost anything, right? All this data we've got, we need to be able to use it. And so what we want to do is we want to go to new hires and we'll collect a little bit of data from you. We want to help with your onboarding, right? So we can measure things like turnover more accurately. We can find out if people would re-accept the job, how satisfied they are, what was their onboarding and training really like, what is the overall engagement of that person. I mean, employee engagement is, is, such a, is, is such a hot buzzword and has been for a couple of years because it's so important to understand, are they engaged in this role? Because if they are engaged in this role, that tells me a lot about my hiring process. We want to quantify that, so instead of just saying it tells me a lot about my hiring process, we can tell some very specific things. Right? We can tell if, if recruiters are providing a realistic job preview. Now, that person turned over, and when I did the exit interview, they told me that the job was totally different than they thought it was. Ooh, big ding, ding, ding. There is a, one data point that tells me I didn't understand the day in a life from the, from the recruiter possible. Or let candidates experience a role. Can they do some sort of ride along? Can they sit? next to that person? Can they follow a more tenured server around a restaurant? You know, you can, 
measure their interaction with their manager. You can understand training a little bit better. Do you have a lot of people fail out of the training class? Huh. Okay. That's telling me something about their readiness to take on that role or their cognitive ability to understand the training class. All these things, feedback, right? This is incredibly important to measure. So you you look at a, a new hire perception survey, you look you do a quality check basically. And this is something the manager does with the employee. A new hire completes this type of perception survey. And then you've got a set of evaluators who go through those surveys to understand that person in their role, understand the impact they're having. So not only do you, can you take this data and put it back in to improve your hiring process, improve your candidate experience, but you understand the impact that new hires have. Their engagement level, if it's a restaurant, are they driving a lot of revenue at tables? If, if it's, um, you know, if, if they're at a, at a call center, are they, you know, are they driving more revenue? What are their minutes on the phone? All those pieces of data can be so critical in improving your hiring process and your candidate experience because you can just get so much more crisp when you collect them, when you do the measurement and you gather the insight. So those are the five keys to outstanding candidate experience. Defining success in the role, right? What makes a person succeed? Job relevant, competency based. A measure candidate job fit. You want to assess those people in an automated, integrated workflow, result in some really powerful and predictive hiring. You want to beat interview exhaustion. Bring structure back, <laughs> right? Ask the right questions, rate responses, turn interviews into data collection. Fourth is get the full story. An automated reference check drives open, transparent, meaningful communication. So important to candidate experience. And then you want to measure the new, a new hire's impact. Right? That helps you measure the outcome of your hiring process. It helps you drive a better candidate experience because you can hire people that are a tighter job fit. When they're a tighter job fit, that candidate experience is much more satisfying for the candidate and for you as a recruiter or hiring manager. And I threw a bonus one in. I threw a sixth uh, bonus slide in um, because it occurred to me that there are some questions that we should all be having as we sit in our leadership team meetings or in our, in our HR meetings. Um, and those questions are, are keys to, to candidate experience. Right? Why would someone want to work for you? And this is like, again, a very classic marketing brand stuff. What is your differentiator to the marketplace? Why would someone want to work for you? I feel like we think we know that, but we don't ever have that conversation because maybe we're afraid of looking silly that we don't know the answer. Maybe we are in a job where we're responsible for knowing that answer, but don't. I don't know what the, what the, why the, what the, what the challenge is there, but we have to ask that question. You know, what level of visibility do you have for your employees in your talent pool? Who's in the talent pool? What do our employees look like with regard to that talent pool? How do employees think about our employer brand? Right? How do, how do candidates think about our employer brand? Are those somehow different? And is that difference significant? Think back to 47% of people, that's the first interaction they have with your brand is becoming a candidate. Incredibly important part. We've got to talk about that in the meeting. Are people going to recommend our company is a great place to work. I mean, you can win award after award after award, but if your employees are like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'd recommend it. I mean, I don't like it. You know, that, that conversation happens. We've got to answer that question. Again, gathering data on which to make decisions and, and get insight about, about your company and its employees. And then what percentage of your managers have had training on how to deliver the brand experience, deliver the interview experience, deliver the candidate experience. We've got we've got to know those answers. So that's that's my bonus. Um, some questions to ask in the in the leadership team meeting in the 
human resources meeting, in the selection meeting, whatever meeting it is you have, whoever needs to be pulled in, pull them in and let's ask and let's answer some of these questions. So, speaking of asking and answering questions, if anyone has questions at this point, I am happy to answer them. So, Dan, any any questions for me uh, yeah. that we want to that we want to cover? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to say great job. No, learned a lot there, Jason. Um, yeah, I've got one question that came through uh, Twitter, and it re regards the assessment uh, in pre-hire. Says, uh, does the length of a pre-hire assessment matter? Hmm. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is a this is a, a, a question we get a lot. Um, especially when you think about what we just talked about, the multi-step process, the holistic view. You know, I, these are big concepts and potentially jargony terms, and so they may sound complicated and complex, and oh boy, I've got, a, I've got an application, and I've got interviews, and now I need an assessment, and then I'm going to do a reference check. And, you know, it's not about the length of the assessment. It's about the effectiveness of that assessment when you take it. And that's why defining job success is so important, right? Because defining that job success says, here are the core, the key pieces to be successful in this job. We have to assess for those key things, for that definition. And that doesn't mean you have to ask about every possible thing you need to ask about. That means you need to ask the right questions to get to that definition of success. Typically, that can be done in about 10 minutes. Now, if you're hiring a CFO, you may want something a little more rigorous because that at an executive level may carry a bit more risk for your business. But for most of what we do, you're looking at shorter assessments because you're really trying to get at that core definition of job success. And that doesn't require a tome. That doesn't require 50 pages of questions. You know that's 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 pretty simple, kind of a ten minute uh, ten minute situation. All right, perfect. Um, and just one more came in. Uh, sure. It says, "Great presentation, thanks." Um, huh. How can technology? And I think you covered a lot of this, but you know, hone in on it maybe. How can te technology support building great candidate experience? Yeah, I, you know, um, great question. Thank you for asking. I think there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, I think the first most important concept here, though, is don't buy technology until you understand what you want from a candidate experience, right? So a piece of technology can facilitate a great candidate experience. It can't force a great candidate experience. So you need you need to do the work on the on the front end to say what do we want our candidate experience to be, and then you want to go out and look for pieces of technology that will fit that. So if part of your candidate experience is we want to make sure that we're very clear about success, the definition of success in this role, and communicate a day in the life, that is something an assessment can do. If you're looking at a piece of technology, you say we want to have this seamless flow between the candidate and our business, you know, that's something that an applicant tracking system can do. If you look at um, skills testing, you know, there's technology out there. How fast can this person type? That's another thing that, that a piece of technology can do. But, so technology is very important in gathering the data and streamlining it, automating and integrating that process. On the front end, what's really important is to say, what do we want that candidate experience to be? And then you go out and find the technology to fit that. Right, and so I think the tech part of it is is really important, um, but but the you can't you can't overlook the strategy of what you're trying to accomplish and why, and then and then you'll find technology to fit that, and, and really is just like anything else, right? Um, any other any other piece of business, if you talk to your CFO about here are the financial reports I need now, how do I go get those? Right, I know the strategy now, I'm going to go get a piece of technology to help me do that. Same same concept there. Okay. Great, thank you. And then I've got another one here, and uh, it's around um, in the pre, like onboarding, pre-boarding. Um, how involved do you think the recruiter the recruiter should be 
in the pre-boarding process, meaning after offer letter is signed uh, to the employee's first day? Yeah, so, you know, that's a great question, and I think um, my personal opinion is it depends on the size of the business, and it depends on on the flow of applicants, right? So if you're if you're uh, hiring high volume, it may be challenging for that recruiter to stay connected, um, you know, be, because that recruiter is is responsible almost like a, a, a sales quota, right, for bringing a certain number of people in. So I think that's that's business dependence, but but from a candidate experience thing, what what is so important, and I've seen this personally, and I've talked to other um, HR managers and hiring managers, you know, there's a handoff. And so at some point, you know, at some point the recruiter's job is to hand that person off to the hiring manager for interviews or to hand that person off for uh, negotiation. Um, and so that, that handoff needs to be very transparent. Thank you, Dan. It's been great talking to you. You're now going to get in the next phase of the uh, of the selection process, and that's working with Brianna, who is the hiring manager in this case, and you're going to have your conversations with Brianna, and so that will be your main contact. I'm always here for you, obviously, but this is the part of the selection process where we hand it off. So, you know, I, in my experience, I see that more effectively, certainly at Outmatch, where we, where we have customers, we have lots of customers who have high volume hiring, it's difficult for the recruiter to stay connected that way. In smaller businesses, you know, the recruiter may wear more hats, and so that's the point of connection all the time. But if there is some handoff throughout the process, it needs to be really transparent. You know, essentially, we're handing you off, <laughs> and you're in good hands, but you can always get back to me if you need it. Perfect. Um, I figure we put uh, two minutes back in everybody's day. If, uh... So thank you for answering those questions, Jason. You uh, you're welcome, and thanks for thanks for asking. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We covered a lot of information, and certainly if any other questions come up, you can contact us at info at outmatch.com or always at Twitter um, at outmatchhcm with the hashtag out, outmatchinsights. Um, our next webinar will be October 6th, and uh, invites for that should be coming out uh, within the next couple weeks. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. We have a recorded version that will go out uh, if you'd like, as well as the slide deck.